Thank you. It strikes me, looking back at 1986, uh, this was something that took a long time to coalesce. Uh, it was in the works for about three years' time. When you look at the timetable for tax reform now, how optimistic are you that this can happen quickly? I'm not optimistic at all. I mean, I think that the first point is until an administration puts a detailed, specific proposal to the Congress, it's just talk. It's just, you know, stimulating this talk, that talk. You have to have a specific proposal. You have to have principles that guide that proposal. You have to not increase the deficit. You have to maintain, you don't increase the gap between rich and poor. There are a few principles that if you had out there, you could actually begin to do it. But it's all, until you get a specific proposal, it doesn't mean anything, and a specific proposal is not one page. And you have to put it out there and all the interests will attack it and then we'll see what you're made of. Uh, you look back at 1986, I wonder if there was a conversation about potential growth like we're having uh, here. The White House saying, if we were to get tax reform, that would accelerate growth, that's gonna do away with any deficit concerns we might have. Was that same conversation happening back in the early 80s? Um, yeah, but the conversation now is because we're gonna cut rates, we're gonna have dramatic dr growth and we won't increase the deficit. Mm -hmm. That's just pie in the sky. We know that's not going to happen. Therefore, you have to have revenue neutrality. What happened in 1986 is Paul Volcker came to me and said, you know, I like what you're doing on tax reform, but I've been trying to end these real estate tax shelters for a long time, and even with high interest, they're there. So when the chairman of the Fed tells me, keep going, lower rates, eliminate these loopholes for real estate tax shelters and others, uh, that meant something to me. You write about this in a piece for the New York Times uh, when, when, ta when Congress made taxes fair. And what struck me reading that piece was, yes, you had bipartisanship. You were working in back rooms. Indeed, there was work in back rooms back then. Uh, but you also had the involvement of the administration. Uh, you had Paul Volcker involved. You had the Treasury Secretary involved as well. When you look at tax reform today, where is the breakdown? Why isn't there one conversation happening? Why does it seem like there are so many parallel tracks? Well, it's a function of the polarization of our political system. But I think you have to have something in it for each party. Democrats have historically wanted to eliminate loopholes. Republicans have wanted lower rates. So you put those together, you have an opportunity to make a difference. Uh, there was calling in of chits back then. You could get people who were on the fence to come in and support legislation. Why doesn't that happen now? Does it have to do with the media cycle, worries about what might be used against whom on the campaign trail, or is it something greater than that? What's, what's the status of comedy on, on Capitol Hill? Well, I think that the reality is that, uh, and I'm not there, so I can't speak from my experience, but it looks to me like polarization has prevented even discussion. There are some issues, mother and apple pie and so forth, that you can get agreement on. But on the big issues that relate to economics, that relate to taxes, that relate to trade, that relate to any number of other big issues that affect the future of this country, uh, you don't seem to be able to have that. And that requires somebody to reach across the aisle, somebody to take the extra step. Um, you know, one of the things that we were at a very tough point in the 1986 Act, and a Republican gave up a big thing that he wanted so that we would be revenue neutral because he thought that the overall approach was the proper approach. And remember, that was a tax bill that reduced the top rate from 50 to 28. We're not talking about doing that here, but we also put an alternative minimum tax in to make sure that the wealthy couldn't avoid paying taxes by using loopholes. So we ended up with a system where, you know, cut the rate from 50 to 28, eliminated over 100 billion, nearly $100 billion in loopholes, tax capital and labor the same, and gave low-income people one of the biggest tax cuts in their lives. And uh, that doesn't happen with partisanship. That happens with comedy and understanding, mutual respect and trust. And that ultimately is what you have to do if you're gonna legislate effectively. And it's true now, it was true then. And if you don't have that, you're going to continue to have, you know, people standing in a circle shooting uh -huh. at each other. What would you say to lawmakers now about the lessons learned from what was called Gucci Gulch? You had a lot of special interests trying to affect the shape of, of tax reform. Well, How do you avoid a repeat of that uh, this Well, time? the lesson I learned is remind people that the value of all loopholes today is over a trillion dollars. Over a trillion dollars. And so how low could you get the tax rate if you eliminated most of those loopholes? I think it'd be surprising how low you could get the tax rate and raise the same amount of money. 
Uh, the interests now are even more intransigent because the, their money lubricates the process. Mm. And you can't uh, make a, a distinction between the power of the special interest and the money the special interests use to contribute to political campaigns. And uh, the way they call it in, I mean, I understand to be a committee chair in the House now, you have to raise, agree to raise $1.3 million. So there's a price tag on committee chairmanships. That is unheard of. Mm. 